Hello and welcome to my talk about BPF and Spectra. With this talk, I would like to go a little bit into what transient execution attacks are and how the BPF runtime inside the Linux kernel mitigates them. Before we go into that, I would like to talk a bit about microarchitecture. So consider an instruction set like x86. Microarchitecture is basically the way a CPU implements that in hardware. One example you can see here on the right side is the Intel Core 2 architecture and then a general flow overview on the different blocks of that CPU. And that implementation or this microarchitecture can differ between um, CPUs and differ between vendors. For example, vendors could have different optimization goals, consider power consumption versus performance, or there could be new technology shifts and therefore like the internal implementation could change while the, while the general x86 specific specification is still um, considered or like implemented. Microarchitectural concepts, they include a few things. For example, branch prediction. Branch prediction basically predicts the outcome, but also the target of a branch before they're actually known out of order execution. This is basically there to avoid uh, stalling the pipeline in the, inside that CPU. For example, it could be stalled because of loads from main memory and with out of order execution, you could reorder instructions to keep it populated in the meantime. <clears throat> and speculative execution is basically there to uh, continue the execution with the predicted outcome. And that means like if the prediction is true, those predicted, um, those uh, executed instructions, they're allowed to be committed and to retire on the CPU. If the prediction is false, everything basically has to be unrolled and re-executed with the correct outcome. And those instructions that are executed with the prediction, they're basically called transient instructions. And if a rollback happens on this speculation, Basically, there are a few things that need to be restored. For example, old register states, but they are preserved in the CPU and they are properly restored. Memory writes, they are buffered and they can be discarded. However, cache modifications, they are not restored. And because of that, we can have an observable side effect. Um, and then we can use that observable side effect as a uh, side channel to leak data. Um, short primer on caches for the CPU. Caches are basically what you can see here on the right side of the picture. There's an L1, L2, and L3 cache. And they provide fast access to frequently used data uh, for the CPU. And the closer the cache is to the actual core, the less time it requires to load this data. And this can be measured by software in particular. So it can be determined whether a data is in the cache or not. <coughs> uh, examples for uh, access timing of those caches. For example, in the case of the Sky Lake architecture, I picked it as a random example here, accessing data uh, from the L1 cache can be up to four cycles, from L2 cache up to 12, or L3 cache up to 38 cycles at minimum. And for our side channel, there's like a one bit signal that can be used to extract data. It is by measuring the time, how long it takes to access data. If the time delta is low, it means the data is in the cache, of course. If the time data is high, the data is not in the cache and it has to be pulled into the cache first. And this can be compared to known in cache, not in cache timings. So you can infer information from that. To give an example and how uh, with BPF and how uh, data can be leaked covertly, um, you basically have a leaker program and typically if there would be no speculation it would point to a bpf map value under speculation it could point to an out of bound attacker controlled address how we do that i will show in a few examples later and here you would first read a byte from memory then you would shift that to a specific bit position to extract individual bits from it and with the result from this uh, index here uh, which is either hex 200 or hex 300, we can access a valid uh, known BPF map 
And based on the time, how long it takes to access this data in the map, uh, you, could, you can reconstruct the information, uh, the individual bits, whether they were zero or one from that leaked value byte, whether they were in cache or not in cache. And of course, between each runs, you have to bounce the cache lines from the CPU so that you uh, can actually um, reconstruct this data. And generally speaking, uh, it's not just BPF, it was used as an example here, but any runtime is affected because those are hardware bugs. They are not triggered by any software bugs whatsoever, and the execution is actually safe without CPU speculation. Now you may wonder, well, what if you just remove this measuring of time as a means to uh, avoid having such a side channel in the first place? Well, research has shown that uh, such timer can be reconstructed in different ways. So this would not mitigate such attacks and would not be enough. Um, in general, Spectre is basically about injecting misspeculation on purpose and then to covertly leak this data through a side channel. And there are different ways to trigger such misspeculation. And here in this talk, I will give a few examples and also show mitigations that we do inside BPF and the kernel. I won't be able to cover every single aspect because of the time constraints, but I will focus here on Spectre V1, V2, and V4, and later also explain a bit more on how they uh, relate to process capabilities. In case of Spectre V1, it's called bounce check bypass. It is basically to gain out of bound access under speculation. And the CPU basically re reduces the performance penalty by predicting the outcome of branches. What you can see here is you have an instruction stream that the CPU is processing. And here's a table where the CPU can look up based on a given index the outcome, whether a specific branch was taken or not taken. This is typically implemented in CPUs through a so-called PHT, pattern history table. And of course, this is expected to be sometimes wrong. And the index here is typically just a partial virtual address. It's not a full address. And that can uh, lead, as one example, to so-called interference. What you can see here with the P and Q example, if they both point to the same uh, map and, or like index, uh, if they both point to the same index, they can mess with each other and um, then affect the CPU prediction of that. Um, attacks in general, they inject misspeculation uh, for the array bound check so that they can then access data out of bounds. We have a small C example. So if array max in here, if that data is not in the CPU cache, the CPU would go and use the prediction. And if it mispredicted it, you would have an out of bounds access that you can then leak with the example I showed earlier. And one example that is more concrete to BPF here, uh, in the first in the yellow box, you initialize the specific stack slot to zero. Then in the red one, you load an out of bound address that was provided by a map value or inside a map value from user space. And in the next, in the violet box, you, uh, read, uh, you read a specific bound that you then turn into a slow loading variable by uh, binary ending it with one and two. So this will basically result into a known zero constant. And then you subtract 511. So you reach the same stack address as the one before that we populated with zero. And then you check the bounds, whether that provided uh, attacker value um, is the same or not compared to the bounds. And if it is um, in a known bounds where the access would actually be valid, if there would be no speculation, um, then basically you can, uh, under no speculation, you would basically read back the stack slot of zero. And if there would be a misprediction from the CPU, you could then load an arbitrary out of bounds address, and then leak this data. What does the very, how does the verifier mitigate this attack? Basically the verifier will observe that this calculation here will, resol will resolve into a constant, and then it will rewrite this prior pointer arithmetic uh, into a 
pointer arithmetic that is using a constant value so that there's nothing to speculate anymore. So it will basically eliminate speculation if, if it's possible uh, by rewriting those instructions with constants. And what happens if that offset is not known? Well, if it is not known but bounded, you can still add, you can still do pointer arithmetic with that, but then the verifier will redirect, safely redirect speculation to be within array bounds. And this is something that looks like here, you will ask yourself, what's that? Basically that algorithm, I will provide a short example here. If the maximum bound is 32 and the CPU speculated a value of 31, which means the offset is within bounds, then what you can see here, it, it will actually result into an identity function so that the 31 can actually be added. <clears throat> but if there is a value 34 speculated and it's out of bounds, what will happen is the CPU will, like this whole uh, value will be masked to zero so that uh, that speculation is redirected in a branchless way to be within the, C within the array bounds. So basically the steps that the verifier does in here is it observes pointer moves and then derives <coughs> maximum register limits um, to later on generate such rewrite with the algorithm that I showed earlier. And it will also spawn a new verification path to check the program when there is such truncation of the offset to zero so that everything is safe under this path as well. Another example, uh, which will exploit pointer type confusion and the speculation here, what you can see here is like, there are two mutually exclusive paths. Each of them are safe uh, if you would execute them without speculation. But if there's uh, misspeculation, what can happen is that uh, like the, there will be an attacker controlled out of bound access because uh, you know, like the, the, the R6 register here will be overwritten with an attacker provided one, and then we will read the byte out of it and leak it. And basically what will happen is the CPU mispredicts both of these branches uh, to be false so that the code falls true. And this can be done through branch interference, what I showed in the earlier example. An attacker will basically attack uh, colliding entries in the pattern history table so that those two branches are not taken. And then you can leak this data. So what the verifier will mitigate in this, in this case here, it will verify so-called impossible paths for safety that can be reached from speculation. So it will spawn a new verification path um, to simulate this. And if there's such type confusion and it will lead to memory access that is invalid, it will reject the program once you can see in this example here from the verifier. Now going to Spectre v2. Spectre v2 is basically an attack that is targeting the branch target buffer. The branch target buffer is basically there inside the CPU to reduce the performance penalty by predicting the path that branches take. So basically you have an address and, and on, an, on that address there's a branch instruction and the target may not always be known. So the CPU will start to uh, guess on the target uh, address. And that is also expected to be sometimes wrong. And the issue here is that the index into this table as well um, is only taking a partial virtual address, for example, the lower bits only. And an attacker here can inject misspeculation so that it will, uh, it can uh, control the BTB and lead to a misprediction so that it jumps to an attacker controlled code for leaking out data. How is BPF affected here? <clears throat> well, everything is affected that has indirect calls. For example, uh, there can be indirect calls inside BPF helpers. In this case, it's BPF map and different BPF map implementations, um, but it can also uh, another case that is also affected is BPF tail calls here, where you basically look up an, a different program that you jump to based on the map index value. 
I won't go into the indirect call case. I will refer you to the appendix. There are some pointers there if you're interested, but we'll look here a little bit closer into BPF tail calls and um, how they work internally. So think of it as exec we, where you replace the current executing um, process with a, with a new one. Uh, basically in the interpreter, we are looking up a entry from a given array map and we fetch the new program from there and then we start executing instructions from that program. And if you look into the just-in-time compiled code, here's like an example from x86. In the end, we have this indirect jump here um, where we jump to whatever is in the address, whatever address is in the register REX, and that is subject to misspeculation. So in the mitigated case, we basically implement red polines, uh, also called return trampolines to basically trap speculation in a loop. Uh, this was the like original design red polines, this concept from Google folks. And we implemented that in the BPF JIT compiler as well. It basically, uh, like in the yellow uh, box here, you we basically create, uh, we modify the return stack to force a return to the new target address instead. And if there is CPU speculation, this will be captured in this pause L fence loop. Pause and L fence both because to free up CPU resources to avoid wasting them during speculation. And there's also an optimization where we basically can remove the possibility to speculate in general. So if there's no entry inside that BPF tail call map, we fall through. That's the way BPF tail calls work. And in this case, we just emit a no op instruction. And <coughs> if there's actually an, a new target program in the BPF map, um, we will directly jump to it. So it's a direct jump in here. So direct jump versus no up, this can be uh, swapped out. And with that, there's nothing to speculate. This is of course only possible if map and keys, if they are constant, like from different paths. Otherwise we will go and emit a red polyne. And we will do this optimization for privileged in particular. There's a small helper in libbpf, which can be used, which is called libbpf static that we added. And it will basically um, emit a small uh, assembler code, which will then guarantee that um, such optimization can be performed. Now going to the spec 4 case, spec 4 basically attacks uh, the memory disambiguator. Um, which speculates on memory dependency. So for example, consider out of order in, uh, execution on CPUs, uh, it will predict whether a particular load depends on an earlier store. If we, ha we have an example here on the left side. Um, those are all addresses that are not known. Uh, do they all point to the, same, to the same memory location? Well, the CPU does not always know that and it tries to guess or predict uh, that they do or not. And um, that prediction is also expected to be sometimes wrong, of course. And an attacker triggers a misspeculation such that a load can overtake an actual dependent older store. And then um, with such gadget code, you can then read out stale data or out of bound data and use it for leaking. Consider this example. We first store pointer A in a given memory location and then store a pointer B to the given memory location and then load it. If there's a misspeculation on that dependency, it will reorder it. And then you first have to store again to pointer A and then you load it. Instead of loading pointer B, what would be expected under speculative execution, you would then load pointer A. An example attack inside BPF, it's basically about creating fast versus slow registers. So on a given stack slot, um, you first store an out of bound address and then you train on, and, and then you uh, um, copy the R10 register, which is the stack pointer over to R9. And then you train the uh, memory disambiguator to break the R9, R10 dependency link. Then you prepare the program to call into BPF ring buff output, a specific helper function in this case, 
And later on to that same stack slot, uh, we now store a valid map value pointer into the stack and right next to it, we read it out again, but this time through a different register, this time through R9, and then we load data from it. So what can happen here is that <clears throat> the memory disambiguator can misspeculate this uh, R10, R9 dependency, and then it would uh, go and uh, execute that load ahead of the store and therefore, le therefore load under speculative execution this out of bound address and leak data this way. Consider like that without any CPU speculation, we would read out that valid map value pointer again. So where do we actually speculate here? The speculation happens um, because of the call to the BPF ring path output code. Uh, internally, the R10 register is being pushed and popped to the stack because of the uh, calling convention and register R9 stays in the CPU. So this will be in, in a CPU hardware register. So this will be a low latency register and R10 is not yet known. Therefore, the CPU starts to speculate. How's, B, how's the BPF verifier mitigating this? Well, it will observe pointers, fill and fill to BPF stack. Um, this can, for example, happen when uh, LVM compiled programs run under memory pressure, or it will also observe first use of BPF stack slots through data or pointers, and then it will insert a so-called no spec BPF instructions, which then the JIT backends like x86 translate to LFENS instructions, which then avoid this overtaking. And with that, it will be mitigated. How does this relate to process capabilities? Under privileged BPF, which is, for example, used in tracing, where you can actually read kernel memory because you need to work kernel data structures. Uh, those programs, they basically have the Spectre V2 mitigation enabled as with the rest of the kernel and the performance impact can be reduced because of the red Pauline avoidance. And in general, um, there's rather little practical impact for the vast majority of the bigger BPF projects. Unprivileged BPF, if it is enabled, um, it will have all the mitigations transparently enforced and the performance impact can be low to medium depending on uh, how or where the V2 and V4 mitigations are applied. <clears throat> so in short, the BPF runtime transparently applies all the spectrum mitigations and some of those even harden the code also for non spectral attacks. They are enforced on top of the mitigations that are also done by the rest of the kernel. And the BPF verifier partially performs deeper static analysis than compilers because it also spawns path analysis under speculative execution. The verifier tries to eliminate uh, speculation possibilities where possible, and it applies the mitigations for the V4, which are more expensive only when necessary. Um, yeah, and with that, I would like to conclude my talk, and I would like to in particular thank um, Jan, Piotr, Benedict, and Adam, uh, those uh, like uh, security researchers who helped and worked with us to um, improve BPF for the mitigations, and also John for bouncing off um, in Alexei mitigation ideas. And yeah, with that, I would like to open up for questions. Thanks a lot.